Welcome to IDF TV. My name is Frank Nymphius and I'm from the Oracle J Developer and ADF Product Management Team. In this session, we talk about ADF programming best practices. And because there's so much to say, we split it up into four sections. In this session, I talk about ADF business components. In the next, I talk about task flow best practices, then binding best practices. And at the end, we talk about ADF phases and JavaScript best practices. The goal of this series is not to teach everything that can be taught on programming best practices, but at least to give you the 20% of knowledge and skills at hand that hopefully provide 80% of your work to be flawless and without any errors. If we look in ADF, we see then what we see in ADF business components is that it's a framework which is built out of metadata at design time. However, that doesn't mean that at runtime metadata is used. In fact, at runtime it uses Java objects as you can see on that image here. So entity definitions which are expressed in metadata at runtime will use entity input class as the base class to represent a row in the database table. Similar, a view object is represented by a view object implementation class and of course the same is true for the application module. Unlike other technologies, the ADF Business Components framework is fully customizable in its behavior. So that means that you can change the underlying classes, the base classes that we use, and replace them with your own custom classes so that you can change or adapt the behavior of ADF Business Components to your needs. And that's basically our first recommendation for you. Change the underlying behavior if you need it, but even if you don't have a plan for that yet, prepare for it. And the way to do it if you go to the JDeveloper preference screen, then there is a section for ADF business components. You can see that this section lists for every of the IDF business components objects the referenced superclass or base class as you want to call it. Now, if you don't create your custom implementation file, which is basically what you would do if you go to the view object or entity object or application module editor and select the Java tab, then by default the framework classes that we provide with ADF Business Components will be used at runtime. If you create your custom input files, then these extend the custom files or actually the default files that we have in the framework. Now what you really want to do is you want to create an abstraction between your custom files and the Oracle provided base classes. And this is what you do by extending the Oracle base classes. Just go to a Java editor, extend for instance entity impl, and then configure your class as a new base class in this preference editor that you see on the screenshot. The reason why you want to do this is with this abstraction that you put in there, you are flexible to change the behavior of all of your applications. Just to give you an example, if logging or auditing is not yet a topic that you have to think about. Now, if you want to put in auditing or consistent logging behavior, then you would have to revisit all of the entity classes that you created to implement that functionality. Now, if today, even before you start building your ADF Business Components application, you start extending the base classes and replace the base classes in this screen with your classes, then all of the entity and view objects and application modules that are created at design time will reference your class. And of course, your class references the base classes that are shipped by Oracle. So the framework behavior by default will remain. However, you are now in control. And that is why we recommend doing this. Now, for which classes do we recommend this? Well, we do recommend this for the application module. We recommend this for the view object and at least for the entity object and if you want for the view row object and the entity row object classes. If you look into the ADF Business Components framework, there are entity definition or general definition classes. Not necessarily you need to create an abstraction for that because they're not so common to be changed. There are use cases when you want to change that. For instance, you want to have uh, a base class for PL SQL integration and I talked about that when I introduced uh, the use of PL SQL in ADF Business Components. So you want to have a look there. Um, so that would one of the niche use cases where, for instance, the dev classes should have their own um, custom base class created. 
The other recommendation is that within your unique naming structure and everything that you build basically should have a unique naming path at least in the packaging structure but then to some point where the model package naming comes in in ADF business components you can further distinguish the different objects to their responsibility and here you see on the screenshot a selection where entities are going to an entity package where view object goes into view package and you can do the same with association with view links. The benefit of that is especially if you create models with a lot of objects in there they are structured by this package structure so entities are easy to find, view objects are easy to find and view links as well. You can even go further and say okay I want to put stuff into my uh, specific LOV packages and so on in which case you would use refactoring. You can also say okay I want to put all my entities into the entity package but the association should go into entity dot association. Now you can do that just put in for the association this package structure that you want the tool to put into place when you build associations. So that's a recommendation get your code structured and organized. There is a document that we provide on the ADF Architecture Square website which talks about naming conventions because I talked about unique names and unique paths. Now there's a document that comes from the ADF Enterprise Methodology Group, well at least members contributed to the development of this document. It was written by Chris Muir in the end but that provides you a lot of hints and tips on what makes a good naming structure and good packaging structure. So I recommend you go there and get that document. So for the programming aspect with ADF Business Components, one of the first questions to answer is when do you create Impel classes? And here I'm not talking about your custom base class, I'm talking about an Impel class, an implementation class that you create for a specific view object or a specific entity object. The way that you create it, and I mentioned that, is that you just go to the editor, entity object editor or view object editor and select the Java category in the menu on the left hand side and then there's a checkbox you check that and it will create an Impel class. Now this Impel class which you can also create for row implementation um, will provide type safe APIs and there was a long debate uh, internally at Oracle and also on the EMG about what is best practice and really slightly the recommendation I have here one and that is don't create Impel files if you don't need them. So if you're happy with the behavior, if you're happy with the base class behavior, don't create Impel files because they would just let your code base grow and you have to manage that, you have to maintain that. So if there's nothing specific that you want to put into that, don't create it. There are reasons where you want to have an Impel class. One of the reasons is where you want to access um, functionality with Groovy. Uh, Groovy is a dot notated scripting that you can use in ADF Business Components. And if you need more complex access or more complex computation with Groovy, then it's easier to have a view impel class. And this view impel class will expose some public method that Groovy can access and get the values from. So that would be one reason. Another reason is if you need to have typed interfaces. You know, IDF Business Components provides a generic interface and it provides typed interfaces. A generic interface is something like on the view object I can call view object set attribute then give it the name of the attribute and then the value so that's a generic you can also have more typed interfaces where I can generate an input file and the input file will then have a set salary get salary method so this is a typed interface because it certainly also returns the specific type of that attribute so you don't have to know where to cast this to. So this is an argument for having an input file but blindly creating input files does not make any sense here View criteria is another topic to talk about and historically we came from a business components version that didn't have that. So in 10.1.3 view criteria were not an option to apply declaratively. So you could have that programmatically but not declaratively. In 11G and in newer releases we changed that. Now you can have declarative view criteria created which are just like named where clauses. This leads to that you no longer have to put the filter condition, the where condition, into the query itself. And in the past, having the bind variables that define the filter criteria in the query required you to create a lot of view object instances. However, a view object is just a blueprint. 
Yeah, like you can build several houses with different front doors out of one blueprint. You can have different queries defined by one view object by just applying a different view criteria. And we encourage that because it's easier to maintain and easier to use. Because in the end, in the application module, where you select the view object to be exposed on the data control, that will be an instance of the view object. So the basic house that you build out of the blueprint. And here you can assign declaratively or programmatically, depends on what the use case is, the view criteria. And then the view criteria will apply the filter condition. So try to stay away from that. Another hint is that when you create a view criteria, you could provide bind variables. Well, that makes sense to query the um, query returned row set. But we recommend also that you don't accept null values. And by default, it will ignore null values, which means that if a user doesn't provide any value to a bind variable, it will just query with a null value, which is a query for all. And on the slide, we put that this is of bad performance. And the reason this is of bad performance is because it queries all records. No filtering will happen. And that's not a good thing. Another positive aspect is if you use bind variables with few criteria, SQL injection won't happen because bind variables will protect you from that. And if you want to read up or learn more about protection through bind, bind variables, I recommend ADF TV that I recorded about security a while back. And you want to go back there and you get the full picture on why bind variables make sense to have. Here is use view criteria with view objects. Performance. Well, I think there is no developer out there and even you who would build for bad performance. And so is the framework, the ADF Business Components framework, not built for bad performance. So there are some default settings that we take from experience and from customer feedback. And ADFBC now is on the market for more than 10 years. So we have quite some uh, experience gathered and assembled uh, through the use of it, internal and external. So you can more or less rely on that ADF Business Components most likely do things correctly. However, it's the nature of a developer to try to improve performance. So, and that is actually what we reference as premature uh, optimization. So they try to tweak the framework even without understanding fully what they're doing or even without having measured that there's a performance impact. They just don't believe that the view object or the entities they have are of best performance. In many ways, if you start tweaking ADF business components without knowing what you do, chances that you go for the worse is more likely than you go for the better. So first, make sure that you measure. So you should experience performance, of course, in testing. So you shouldn't wait for the application to be deployed, but don't try to premature optimize the ADF business components framework. When you think about tuning, and there's a big section in our documentation written about tuning, think application module pooling. Now, application module pools, what that is, is that every incoming request will be handled by an application module. And you might have heard about the feature called passivation, which is that if there is a request coming in, we query data, there are change data in there. If that request doesn't come back in time, we will just release the application module and persist all the changes to the database or the file system, depends on the um, configuration. Now, when you come back then, based on the user session that you have, we will give you exact the same state back, most likely not in the same application module. And because we do this, we can pool application modules. We can have one application module dealing with 10 user requests, not at the same time, but in a sequence, because there are not 10 users that hit the button at the same time. So there's always some sort of delay in users coming back to an application module. So we can say that an application module most likely will handle 10 to 15 users well. So that means if you have an application module pool of 50 application modules, then you handle 500 to 750 users pretty well. What you th should think in um, or take in consideration though is that if you have 750 users working on a system with 50 application modules, those application modules have a memory footprint and a CPU footprint. So chances are that maybe you experience some performance degradation, but this is not to compensate with a bigger application module, but maybe just with clustering, just having another domain running the same application. And this way you have two or three or whatever, how many virtual machines handling the load. 
So before you go into tuning mode and you see on this screen the dialogue to do this and there are a lot of settings there that needs to be understood. So make sure that you read, understand and then tune. Don't go for premature um, optimization. Read the documentation. It's well written and it's on the market for a long, long time so we can guarantee or I can guarantee that there are good tips in there. Make you understand how to do things and what things are for. Also giving you some hints and tips about testing best practices. So read the documentation and then if you experience performance problems, try and tune this to your need. And also keep in mind, an application module is not the same as another application module. You might have workhorses, application modules that really have a high load because users would work a long time in there because the use case this application module covers is quite big. And there are application modules that have a niche existence because only some users are using it or this is just used maybe once a week. Now the tuning settings or the um, application module pool for these application modules and other settings could be completely different for better performance because the one that you use once a week and maybe for three users doesn't need to hold say 50 application modules just waiting in idle mode for a user to come back. So read it properly, that's our best recommendation we can give. Thank you.